Oh my God, I'm gonna see people just die right in front of me. Mother Nature is in charge across the world. It was almost like uh, the devil. Well, I missed some over here, so I'm gonna turn around and go back and burn that up. Lock it up and get in! And the weather is pushing humans to their limits. Hey, it's coming! Oh my God, look at it! World's wildest weather. Catastrophic and strange weather events from around the globe, filmed on camera by those caught up in the chaos. Fire lines everywhere. Expert meteorologists explain the causes behind the events and show us why our weather is becoming so challenging and life-threatening. One of the most extreme weather systems on the planet is a typhoon. These occur in the Northwest Pacific Ocean. On the 7th of November 2013, one of the biggest typhoons to make landfall hit the Philippine Islands in Southeast Asia. The night before Super Typhoon Haiyan made landfall was one of the most terrifying nights of my life. The scariest moment of Typhoon Haiyan was looking at people trapped in the water and thinking they're gonna die in front of my eyes. More in there, Josh. Once the storm surge started rolling through Tacloban, we knew that potentially thousands of people were dying around us. The area sits astride the typhoon belt and is regularly battered by an annual onslaught of tropical storms. A typhoon is another type of tropical cyclone. It's named a typhoon for the basin, the ocean part that it occurs in, in the Western Pacific. Typhoons can get so big and so destructive because they have a tremendous amount of open Pacific water to work with. It's very warm. They don't have a whole lot of wind shear, disruptive winds to take away from that circulation really getting going. And then it's able to build up enough forward momentum so it can just plow on through, feeding off of the warm oceans the entire way and then carrying with it a surge of water to whatever landmass it impacts. It was clear when we saw the satellite images coming in the night before the storm hit that we were dealing with a potentially record-breaking super typhoon. Typhoon Haiyan was ominously on a collision course with the coastal city of Tacloban, continually building up momentum and its storm surge energy along the way. So we knew all along that storm surge was going to be a huge threat given that most of the city lies on this small peninsula surrounded by the, the ocean. But when it actually hit, you know, it was hard to envisage what was going to happen and how it was going to go down. And it still took us by surprise. It had plenty of time to get going and organized and to become a, just a massive, huge wingspan typhoon. So that meant that it was carrying with it a tremendous amount of surge. And that's really what did the most damage. It wasn't just the fact that it was bringing with it some of the worst wind speeds that a typhoon can carry, but it was also bringing with it a wall of water that moved inland. In some cases, it was measured 17 feet or taller. That's bigger than a two-story home in some cases. To the east of the Philippines, Typhoon Haiyan increased to a massive Category 5 typhoon. The night before Haiyan hit Tacloban, the city was eerily calm. I remember walking around the city and people were just kind of hanging out, playing pool, drinking beer. People clearly did not understand what was coming. The weather bureaus were throwing out wind speeds, which we'd never seen warned before. That was quite terrifying uh, to know that we were committed, to we were there and there was, there was no escape. Typhoons occur because of a disturbance, and that disturbance could be a complex of thunderstorms that starts to form, and they're really disorganized, but then they're able to have enough of them coming together with little other disruptive pieces to its development over warm ocean water that allows for them to start to spin together as one unit. So you'll see that spin start to happen as it then moves westward generally toward very populated parts of Asia and the Pacific Islands. 
the Philippines is the world's capital for intense tropical cyclones. More than the US, more than Mexico, more than any other country, the Philippines gets these really intense typhoons all the time. And I think the problem there is that they're used to them. They experience them all the time. So when a really, really exceptional one comes, people don't realize that this one's gonna be different. I felt that people didn't understand really what was coming, and I was right. The USA has experienced some of the most gut-wrenching tornadoes ever dealt with by humanity. Tornado Joplin was a catastrophic multiple vortex tornado, which hit the town of Joplin, Missouri on May 22, 2011. Now this tornado had winds in excess of 200 miles an hour, and it lasted an immense 38 minutes. Forecasters call it a loaded gun. During a tornado season in the US, there'll be on average around a thousand tornadoes, but only 20 will be in excess of an EF3 or greater, that's a violent tornado, and with that, possibly only one EF5. Its path was a mile wide, but it tracked over 22 miles, and in its wake, there lay a huge amount of devastation. A tornado is a violently rotating column of air that connects from a cloud to the ground, and you have to have that connection for it to be called a tornado. On the 22nd of May 2011, the large city of Joplin was devastated by an EF5 tornado. One particular region of the USA has the most storms. It's referred to as Tornado Alley. This is where Tornado Joplin forced itself into the record books in the US state of Missouri. Tornadoes come from thunderstorms, from cumulonimbus clouds. And in Tornado Alley, the ingredients sometimes are just ripe for everything to come together to create these violent tornadoes. So what do we have? We have a very warm, surface air coming up from the Gulf of Mexico, which is loaded with moisture. And then we have the upper air winds, which are coming from a cold direction, that's the north or northwest, moving over the Rockies, which gives the clash between the warm and the moist and the cold and the dry. In between, we have some dry air coming in from the West Plains. And this all really brings together an explosive set of circumstances, which sometimes can lead to tornadoes. Yeah, I don't know if you can tell on this camera, and I don't know if you can hear, but these clouds are rapidly spinning. That right there is a tornado. Holy crap. Tornadoes are actually quite common in the United States. We have more than any other area in the world. Generally, we get more than a thousand tornadoes a year. Oh, hey. hey, it's coming. Oh my God, look at it. They can happen any time of the year, any season, under an, almost any circumstance, but there are some key ingredients that are very common for tornadoes to form. Generally, you want moisture, good moisture, but you can't just have a, a hot, humid day. You need to have something to force it to rise, that air at the ground level and that moisture to start rising. That trigger could be a boundary at the ground level or a cold front or a warm front, any kind of boundary at the surface that's going to help trigger. It's called lift. It helps to lift that air mass up and get it going, sort of like kicking a ball into the air. You want to give it that initial nudge. I have to stop. This thing is getting bigger and bigger. This thing is getting large. Now, there's a larger feature which occurred during the time of Joplin, and that was the existence of gravity waves. These gravity waves billow out like throwing rocks in a pond, and you can see them sort of undulating through the middle part of the atmosphere. And what it means increases the spin of things like tornadoes, like an ice skater spinning around and elongating their body so they spin faster and faster and faster. So the existence of these gravity waves really enhances the energy and the instability and the spin within these storms. Straight, straight, go, 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 go. Actually, go straight, go straight. 
It's dangerous to be caught in a tornado, period, regardless of how strong or how weak it is. With the big ones, you have to be in, an, in a sheltered, secure place. Generally, a well-built structure, concrete's best, below ground is ideal. It's best to be at the innermost room, lowest level of whatever structure you're in. Jenna, I can't tell you, I can't stress to you enough. Stay in the cellar, all right? And get away from windows and put as many walls between you and the outside as possible. That's going to increase your potential of surviving a tornado with minimal damage to yourself. At 17 minutes past five, the first warning sirens rang out as touchdown in the Joplin area was imminent. Keep my wife safe, she's over there, Lord. Oh my goodness. In the case of Joplin, it accelerated to an EF5 so rapidly, warnings are only so much use, particularly when a tornado of this violence can level a block of flats. People were told to get somewhere safe immediately. 82% of the homes in the Joplin area did not have basements. So where do you run when there is a warning for a tornado? At 34 minutes past five, the tornado swept into the city with only 17 minutes advance notice. I just saw a car flying yeah. through the air, man. Thought I'd warn you guys if yeah, it starts turning this way. The Joplin tornado, which was in Missouri, was tough because it was warned, but not everyone heard the warnings about 20 minutes in advance. The tornado's track went directly through the heart of the town, hitting key places like the school, the high school, the medical facility, the hospital. They all took direct hits. And this tornado was getting wider and wider, and the winds were also getting stronger, so it ended up producing EF5 damage. The escalating power of the tornado as it hit the built-up areas was catastrophic. That's why Joplin was so terrible, is there were people who didn't hear the warnings before they came, even though they were issued, and it was growing and intensifying as it was moving into a very densely populated part of town. Here we are, Joplin, Missouri, after the tornado. We're at the church. It's almost completely destroyed. Around 7,000 buildings were destroyed. When I say destroyed, they were decimated. On average, there are 70 deaths from tornadoes every year in the US, but in the case of Joplin, 158 people lost their lives and over 1,000 were injured. Devastation in all directions, total devastation. The magnitude, intensity, and overall destructive power of typhoons has increased over the last 40 years. Scientists now suspect that the cause has been the increasing water temperatures around the world due to global warming. On the 7th of November 2013, the Philippines witnessed their damaging power when Typhoon Haiyan wreaked havoc in its wake, ranking as the most powerful typhoon on record. It wasn't until daybreak that we really got a clear inkling that a powerful typhoon was, was getting close. So I was watching the satellite images and I could see the typhoon was getting closer and closer to the city. We were quite close to it, but the weather wasn't that bad. It was just sort of cloudy, rainy. And I'm like, where's the typhoon? The ocean surrounds the city on, on basically three sides. The city was extremely vulnerable, and especially our hotel, since it was three stories high. I remember just around 7 a.m. wondering, where is this thing? Is it gonna hit? And then all of a sudden, I looked across the city and across the bay, and I could see it coming. It was just like this wall of wind and rain, and it just swept into the city, and then things went nuts. Josh and James managed to capture the colossal force of nature that was Typhoon Haiyan as it struck the small islands of the Philippines. In the space of 45 minutes, it went from pretty manageable to hell on earth. This thing was just like, it was like a bullet. The debris was flying into the corridors of the hotel. Uh, windows were blowing out. When the wind reached its full force, 
You know, we were in this city, so the wind was just swirling between the buildings and wreckage was just flying all around, slamming into other buildings. It was just totally wild. I never saw anything like it. And you could hardly see 20 yards away because of all the flying debris, all the rain, the wind. It was really something. After about a half hour, the wind just started to lessen a little bit, just enough so that you could see the street again. And we noticed that the water was just rising. We hadn't even seen it because it was so chaotic with all the wind blowing around. And literally, the ocean was just invading the city. This tremendous storm tide just came up and swept the entire downtown area, and the whole city was underwater. The whole first floor of the hotel, the lobby, the courtyard, everything was underwater, and it was rapidly coming up. And that's when I realized, wow, I can't just stand here and watch. I gotta help. Like, people are gonna die. People really started freaking out and panicking, especially so when we could hear people smashing windows and screaming from the ground floor hotel rooms, which were essentially underwater and filling up, uh, and people were trapped inside. It was just a mad rush to get everyone to the second floor. Now, the problem was people in the first floor rooms were trapped. By the time they realized what was happening, because it happened so fast, the water was too high. They couldn't open the doors, and the water was just coming up. They were trapped in their rooms. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to see people just die right in front of me. Out of this dark, flooded corridor on the ground floor came this elderly couple, and the husband was in a wheelchair. He was very frail. So Mark and Josh just immediately pitched in, grabbed him uh, in the wheelchair, and hauled him two floors up to safety and away from the flooding. Got up to those rooms, they smashed the windows, and we were just pulling people out of the windows, putting them on mattresses, and then ferrying them over to the main staircase to get them upstairs. The stairs was slippery and essentially just a waterfall from all the flooding and the wind was whipping into the hotel and there was debris. One at a time we did that and we managed to get everyone up the stairs. Every child, every disabled person, everyone up the stairs. As I was walking through the storm surge water, I could feel this weird tingling sensation in my legs. My mind was racing to think what it could be and I, I could only conclude that it was some sort of electrical current. Okay, I can feel a lot of people get killed during typhoons by electrocution. It's a pretty common way to, to get hurt. So it really freaked me out quite a lot. The incredible thing to me about this typhoon's destructive power was how fast it happened. The ocean came up and just swallowed up the city. The whole city went underwater and then it just seemed to suck back into the bay. And it was only about an hour or an hour and a half that most of that was happening. Understanding the impact of storm surges is a science in itself. There are so many factors. When high tide is, the direction of the wind and the strength of the wind. Not only that, how steep the coastline is. A whole city of 220,000 people went underwater. And, and that sort of event is going to be a catastrophe, and it was. The Filipino government declared a state of national emergency. There was no clean water in the decimated city, and looting began as food sources were scarce, roads were impassable, and aid could not reach the injured survivors. We stepped outside into the city, and it was like you, you, you couldn't recognize a lot of it. Whole city blocks just flattened as if by a nuclear bomb, you know, dead bodies. Of the streets were just buried in debris and tangled power lines, and people were just wandering around in a sense of shock. I walked down to the waterfront, and the whole place had just been wiped out. People looking for their loved ones, it was an awful scene. There was a complete breakdown of societal order. The whole parts of the city were flattened, thousands of dead people. The infrastructure wiped out. This was the real deal in terms of epic catastrophes. It was clear we needed to leave the city as quickly as possible. The rooftop of our hotel gave us a view of the airport, which was about two miles away across the bay. Uh, and that was extremely useful because we knew that 24 hours after the storm had hit, the military planes had started landing there. And as luck would have it, we spoke to a senior Air Force officer who explained that the helicopters were coming into town with food, water and medicines, but running back to the airport essentially empty. 
and he offered us a lift on one of the helicopters and it was, you know, an offer we couldn't refuse. If the people in the way had understood what was coming and had really comprehended it and they knew what storm surge meant, they knew that that meant the ocean comes up onto the land, all those people wouldn't have died. Super Typhoon Haiyan was classified as one of the most powerful storms on record. The death toll was over six and a half thousand people. Estimated cost for rebuilding ranged from 12 to 15 billion US dollars. And economically, it will take years to recover from the force of nature that was Typhoon Haiyan. In 2015, the United Kingdom was battered by multiple storms. First, Storm Desmond, and then hot on its heels, Storm Eva. Thousands of homes were left without power and completely flooded out. You see things like this on television, but you never have any idea that it will affect you. I guess it's just so unlucky that it actually did. Storm Desmond was supposed to be a once in a decade storm. I mean, I hope I never see that again. They operate um, right on the limits of, of their professional ability to save people's lives. There had been some smaller floods before, but there was absolutely nothing like what we'd seen. So any minute now, this is going to go. You think they'd be killed? There had been two major floods across northwest England during the decade leading up to 2015, namely 2005 and 9. But the floods which occurred during 2015 broke all rainfall records. The weather conditions in the run up to December didn't appear to be very unusual for that time of year. But more unsettled patterns were being seen year on year due to global warming and changes in sea temperatures. In the autumn of 2015, we saw a period of quite wet weather, so sustained raining that uh, really made the ground quite sodden. Uh, so the water table rose. Within a single day, Storm Desmond had broken the United Kingdom's 24-hour rainfall record with 341 millimetres of rain. One of the issues with Desmond as it pushed in was that the rain became aligned with the wind. So there was no forcing one way or another. It just kept persisting in one particular region. So rainfall totals were in excess of three, perhaps even 400 millimeters, which says to forecasters it is going to flood. But because of the dips in the valleys of this region, the rain and the water was concentrated in the lower levels, falling really rapidly down the hills. Storm Desmond pummeled the UK first on December the 5th, bringing with it extreme rain and winds of up to 99 miles per hour. Storm Desmond has battered Cumbria, bringing with it heavy rain and strong winds. Cumbria police have declared a major incident and there are still 40 severe flood warnings across the county. The force says organisations are using their specialist skills in the face of very challenging weather conditions. On the 5th of December, a red alert was issued. Flooding and damage to property or loss of life was imminent. The call went out. HM Coast Guard and Alan Howard's mountain rescue team were just some of the teams scrambled to attend the extensive flooding in Cumbria. There was a torrent of water just piling down the main street. There was no way you'd get into it. It was just so serious. It's a late Saturday night in December. Um, we've been called up uh, to Cumbria to help with the floods. Um, it's a pretty serious flooding. It looks like it's the worst flooding they've had in years from what I'm seeing tonight. Appleby in Cumbria was massively affected by the floods. Flood defences were being breached and huge areas of the town were cut off and people were stranded by the rising waters. I'm in Appleby, the place is completely cut off. We've just been in the river. Um, I've been up to my waist, in fact, up to my chest at some point, um, next to people's front doors. Um, the river's completely flooded, the bridge is flooded, um, the whole town's cut off, so we're just trying to go door to door, uh, make sure that nobody's stuck. The volunteer mountain rescue staff worked all through the night in sewage-infested waters until the very early hours of the morning. 
We were up till about five, half five last night. I managed to grab a couple of hours uh, sleep. Attending a flood isn't really a normal day job for a mountain rescue team. It is quite rare. They tend to come in batches, so maybe we'll get one or two floods in a short period of time. Are you all staying? It's a really strange atmosphere when you go into these floods. Um, I mean, for starters, cars are abandoned. As you go through, it, it's a really eerie kind of kind of place because what would normally be really busy is is really quiet. Except for people who are stuck in their houses. Are you all right? Yeah. Even though the rain had stopped, the water levels kept on increasing. First of all, we've got to look at uh, the vulnerable care homes uh, where we've got hospitals. Those need to be evacuated. Okay. Our street's still completely flooded, so we can't actually get to the house yet. Cumbria police are urging people not to return to their flooded homes across the county tonight. They've advised people to self-evacuate. I think we're going to evacuate the whole street. River levels are still rising, so when we get down the bottom, um, it's, it's, it's pretty much over my shoulder height, so I'm floating, I can't actually touch the bottom. Within the United Kingdom, we've become very good at uh, working cooperatively. Where you've got fast water and you've got vulnerable people in uh, difficult to access areas, uh, sometimes a helicopter is the only real safe means by which you can carry out that recovery. Across northwest England, Cumbria and Lancashire, over 5,000 homes were flooded. Rail links were blocked, the army was called in as bridges were damaged and no one could get in or out. Cumbria suffered massive damage. Whole communities were left homeless, villages were cut off and the army was deployed to help with the rescue effort. But there was another storm yet to come. In the wake of Storm Desmond, which happened at the beginning of December, the land was totally saturated, and all it took was another storm to hit the UK across Northern England, and that's exactly what happened on Boxing Day. The imbalance in the weather system, which is being brought on by climate change, is shifting our weather patterns. Kansas in the USA has seen much wetter springs which is increasing the growth of grass, brush and trees in the early season. You'd think that would be a good thing, but then it's a huge bonfire waiting for a match to ignite it. In the 34 years I've been fighting fire, we've never been up against a fire like this one. You guys stay in your trucks. It's coming. Get ready. It was almost like uh, the devil. Well, I missed some over here, so I'm going to turn around and go back and burn that up. Part of it was the smoke. I mean, it was just, you know, it was so thick you could cut it with a knife. This fire was just a monster. It ate everything in front of it. It didn't care what, it didn't care who. It just was big and getting bigger. The 2017 Kansas wildfire burnt over 650,000 acres of land. 2,000 volunteer and service firefighters battled the fires for days trying desperately to keep them under control. The day that we had the uh, big fire, it was really warm uh, early that morning, like by 8 o'clock. We were actually working cattle. We had, uh, had moved all the cattle pretty close to the area where we are right now, and we were processing those cattle, giving them their vaccinations. We had been getting uh, information on the radio and through the forestry that it was going to be a bad day. We just didn't know where it was going to happen. Uh, the wind was uh, pretty strong, and the humidity just kept dropping lower and lower and lower. It is thought that the fires started in the neighboring state of Oklahoma, and with tinder dry grass and ever-changing winds picking up speed, the relentless fires were now raging towards Kansas. We noticed and smelt the smoke, and. With that much wind, you had reason to be concerned, and so I told the crew that I'm going to go check it out. I was hearing all the commotion over my police radio, and, and that's when I, I learned that there were, uh, a fire had started up by Wilson Lake, and uh, the 60 to 80 mile per hour wind were pushing it very quickly to the south. Met up with another rancher, and, and we could see the fire, and we could see where it was. At that time, the wind was out of the south, and with that, 
uh, 60, 70 mile an hour winds, we thought the best thing we could do was stay out of the way. A wildfire is a fire that starts generally in a natural environment and gets out of control. It could be started by natural causes such as lightning or a man-made cause, dropping a spark or a cigarette butt, anything that can trigger a fire. The closer I got, I could see the smoke, the plumes of smoke. Uh, I, you could see that it was, it was growing and growing, getting bigger and bigger. Well, you have to answer the question, what is a fire to begin with? It's combustion. It's when you have several pieces that come together to create a fire. You need oxygen, you need air to feed that fire. You need a fuel source. It could be dry grass uh, or tinder, anything that is going to catch fire and help that fire continue to happen. And you need to be able to have that, that spark, whatever is going to ignite the fire to begin with. So you need all three factors in order to lead to a fire in the first place. Also, we look at the vegetation or the plant growth in the area. Fuel load, that's the amount of trees or plants, but also the moisture content of these trees and plants. And during a drought, the moisture content goes down. Wildfires are very unpredictable and can be ignited in the most remote places. And so sometimes it's a long time before they are spotted and by then they're out of control. We respect fire and you try to learn to uh, uh, try to outthink it and sometimes it really fools you. The wind direction has a lot to do with it. So you constantly have to be on your toes listening to the weather and trying to figure out what's in front of it and where the houses are and where the big fuel is and where to attack it at. what happens in, in flat areas. If you get different boundaries, perhaps you've had in the Southern Plains of the United States, you get something that's called a dry line. It's literally just a boundary between hot, dry air coming out of the desert regions of the Southwest, as well as the moist air coming in from the Gulf, which is generally pumped in from a strong southerly wind. You get that conflict and you'll have a fire start on one side of the boundary with winds coming from the south. But as soon as that boundary passes over that wildfire location, it's going to immediately shift those winds. That makes it incredibly dangerous for the people that are trying to fight the fire, first of all, and then for those who thought, well, I'm safe in my home or where I'm at. But as soon as those wind shifts, so does the way that the fire grows and moves, and that makes it particularly dangerous. At that point in time, the wind was out of the south, and we were, we felt we were safe because it was going 60, 70 miles per hour to the north. It was not going to come this way. The wind switched and it came out of, straight out of the west, and that changed the whole fire. Now, all of a sudden, this fire was roaring towards us. And stay in your trucks. It's coming, get ready. We saw it coming, and there was fire and flames as far as you could see, and we turned around and went back to our house. Mark could never have predicted what the fire was about to do next. We had a couple horses at home, and we had a couple of dogs at home, and so we rushed back to the house and the fire hit our house so the same time we got there. Wild weather phenomenons are becoming commonplace around the globe. Our weather patterns are changing and people struggle with what nature unleashes. The British Isles was reeling under the intense lashing it had received from Storm Desmond in early December 2015. There was still more flooding to come as Storm Eva decided to deliver its deadly Christmas present to the north of England. Our business was actually in um, an old mill called Pioneer Mill, which was built, I think, in the 1900s. The building was situated right next to the River Irwell on a bend, which also has kind of a bit of a bottleneck in the river as well. It had flooded a couple of times, never really anything major. The northwest of England is known for wet weather, but nothing like the unstoppable rainfall they were experiencing during Storm Eva. On Christmas Day, we did notice that it had been raining a lot, and I'd subscribed to the environmental agency's uh, flood alerts. I received a text message and a phone call, which basically said that we needed to take whatever measures we could, as uh, there was a severe risk of flooding. From then, it just carried on raining. It really didn't stop all throughout Christmas Day. Um, and I knew it was going to flood, so I didn't know how bad. There's several 
types of floods. Um, all of it involves an awful lot of water being in the wrong place at the wrong time. This is our house. That's our house with the shed that's flipped upside down and our front door. The water has gone down, fortunately, from the front of the door. Throw the neighbours of their car. Wide area flooding uh, tends to be what we experienced in the north of the country where uh, rivers were, were bursting their bank and uh, you know, huge tracts of land were being affected along with many, many people. Those kayak lessons weren't a waste then, were they? Storm Eva was causing major problems all over the UK. The emergency services were being stretched to their limits right across the country, from Cornwall to Scotland. In Cornwall, the, the flooding down there was, was very localised and it was uh, water runoff into valleys, the streams and the rivers weren't, weren't coping. These flash floods are, are more of a, uh, a really short but very heavy uh, period of rainfall. As a forecaster, when you see the potential for in excess of 300 millimetres of rain, flooding is inevitable. The storm was affecting many parts of the UK, but the most torrential downpours were being seen in the northwest of England. Up north, you had a much greater area being, being impacted. Jesus is cute. <laughs> with uh, far more infrastructure issues affecting the local authorities that had to respond to that. With the devastation from Storm Desmond still fresh in people's minds, there was hope that Storm Eva would be kinder to them. But over the Christmas period, the rain kept on falling. As we've been flooded with kind of minor floods before, I just thought it was gonna be something similar to that again. As the day progressed, when I was getting more and more updates, it came, kind of became apparent later on that it was much more serious than anything we'd experienced before. So this was the first year, incidentally, that the UK decided to name their storms alphabetically. Storm Eva pushed in again from the Atlantic, and this covered a swathe of counties from Cumbria, Lancashire, right the way across to North Yorkshire. And pretty much within 24 hours, many communities were underwater. The continual rainfall only added to the already sodden ground, and the whole region braced itself again for more flooding as Eva bore down on the area. I was updated by my friends who had other businesses there. I got more, more kind of text messages, pictures, phone calls, and then the water level just really started rising and going into the building. It became unusually mild for December, and that's because this stream of air was loaded with moisture from the Caribbean, and it meant the rain was going to be enhanced. There was going to be a lot of intense rainfall. And that's exactly what happened. Where the UK sits, a lot of the time, it's in the firing line for depressions, and that's because these depressions are steered by what we call the jet stream, which is a ribbon of upper winds. The winds are very strong in the upper atmosphere, but they do affect the weather at lower levels. And during this time, the jet stream was right across the UK, with colder air coming from the north, warmer air from the south, and a clash of air masses producing these deep depressions. Storm Eva brought more rain, which added to the unprecedented rainfall and resulted in the highest recorded river levels in the area. The violent aftermath of the storm was escalating. A 200-year-old pub in the village of Somerset completely collapsed into the river, and a bridge buckled as a gas main exploded. The weather was waging war on the UK. The flooding ruined all our stock and I remember kind of going down there and just looking at the devastation that was caused. Their business was completely wrecked. They lost all of their stock of paper products and without insurance, Chris knew that they had lost their livelihood. When we got there and we actually saw it for ourselves, just the sheer amount of devastation, the kind of silt, silt left behind and just mud everywhere, uh, everything drenched. We, we pretty much knew straight away that that was it. And, you know, it was, it was overwhelming, to be honest. It's all, all right. Uh. It was really sad to just see so many people who were kind of potentially going to lose their livelihood. 
Storm Eva and the Christmas flooding she brought in her wake damaged more than 2,250 homes and 500 businesses. The damage to infrastructure was estimated at one to one and a half billion pounds. From floods to fires, the world is being tested by extreme weather. In Kansas, Mark Gardner and volunteer firefighters Bernie and Levi Smith are witnessing an inferno traveling at 60 miles an hour heading straight for them. We fought multiple fires, but this one was running 70 mile an hour on the ground and it was just eating everything in front of it. We turned around because the fire was coming right at us and we knew it was headed for our house and for our animals and for um, where all the people were. All of a sudden, um, the largest fire anybody had ever seen was coming straight towards everybody. The wildfires that happened in parts of the Southern Plains, just east of the Rockies, were terrible because you had those long-term conditions setting up. You had a long-term drought. You had the winter that did not bring what it needed to keep the ground saturated. And then you had multiple wind shifts from multiple boundaries, a cold front, a dry line, several different wind shifts happening over a short period of time that allowed for once the fire started to really spread out of control. Multiple fires raged over the whole region, pushing the limits of the volunteer firefighters. We learn on every fire that we go out on, you constantly have to be on the lookout for wind shifts and train changes, uh, because that's gonna change the behavior of the fire. I was sitting in the median of I-70, that's basically the grassy area between the, the east and westbound lane, and I was sitting there looking north towards Wilson Lake and watching that fire just steamroll towards us and uh, wondering when I, I should shut the interstate down and stop cars from going through. Guys, if you need to pull your bunk on that chimney. We rapidly turned around and raced back to let everybody know we were calling people on our way to get out of there. We went to our house to try to save our horses and our dogs. What we saw was a uh, a line of 20, 30, 40 foot flames. We went into the house, my, my wife and I did. We were trying to capture the animals or to catch them and they were too frightened. And I lost my wife in the smoke at the house. It was on fire at that time. I was trying to yell for her and I could see that, that her pickup was gone. I said, okay, she's gone, she's safe. I need to get out of here. At that time, the fire uh, had jumped into the median of, of I-70, and I mean, as soon as it touches that really dry grass we had at that time, I mean, it just, I mean, it was like putting gas on a fire, it just it, it ignited, exploded, and just took off. I grabbed a few of the pictures of our boys uh, off of our bedroom dresser. Ever since my wife and I have been married, we'd, we'd written letters to each other since we were young, and there's a, there was a box of letters in our, in our dresser, and, and I saved that box of letters. I got in the truck and and I couldn't see. At that point, it was totally black. So I pull up to the semi truck as he's trying to back, go, go forward, go backwards. He's trying to just move his truck in any direction it will go. I was in a panic. <laughs> I was like, I just, how do I get this guy out of here now? This fire was unprecedented. You know, it uh, it just kept going and kept going. Within seconds, the fire had jumped I-70 behind us and like I said fire was everywhere it was on it was on all four sides of it uh, you could barely see barely breathe and that's at the point I decided we're just abandoning the truck because the truck could be replaced you know our lives could not lock it up and get in we were very exhausted we fought fire for 52 hours straight you just keep going because you have no choice we had a full crew of firemen that day it was a constant battle from the time we started until it was sometime early Tuesday morning when the when the humidity got high enough it it uh, it kind of slowed it down a little bit. The guys they they never backed up they just kept going and I was very proud of the firemen because they never faltered and uh, it got pretty intense sometimes. At that point in time I mean the smoke was still there and the house was still burning but the the major fire was gone. When the sun come up, you can start seeing the damage, uh, the burnt fences, the grass gone, the houses still smoking. 
uh, tractors burn. We love these animals. I mean, the dogs are actually the hardest thing we lost, and, and we saved the horses, uh, but they're family members. And, uh, you know, we're stockmen, all the cattle that we lost, and, and the hardest thing was that we could save all them. So, excuse me. Oh, okay. We're tough, we're not supposed to cry. We'd been fighting the fire about 48 hours when we had help from Colorado come in, and so we went and checked on our property then. It burned basically the whole ranch. Uh, we found uh, uh, quite a few cows that had been burned uh, that were dead or dying. We were hit hard, but everybody was hit hard. As we look back on it, uh, we're all very fortunate. It's a true blessing that, that no, no more people perished than, that, that, than they did. In Kansas alone, the fires ravaged at least 600 square miles of grasslands. It's estimated it will take tens of millions of dollars to rebuild their devastated livelihoods.